Welcome to Critical Role Demystified, I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn, as DMs and as players, from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 25 of the Vox Machina campaign, Crimson Diplomacy. Some of you might be able to tell, but I lost a little weight. I got a stomach virus, I lost 5 pounds in a week. I couldn't even handle toast, I literally only had one banana per meal for days. I do not recommend it. However, I want to take a quick moment to celebrate something. This is my 100th video on this channel, and at the end of this month, I will have been doing this for a year. That is absolutely wild, and all the support you've shown me over these past 100 episodes mean so much to me. Thank you so much for making this a truly wonderful experience, and I can't wait for you to see what I have in store for the next 100 videos. Now let's get into the episode. At the top of this session, Sam is gifted a scale-appropriate stein by the critters, which he will continue to drink out of for the rest of the campaign, regardless of how unwieldy it is to use, because let it not be said that Sam Regal doesn't commit to the bit. When we last left off, Vax was in the Briarwood's guest suite, and Silas Briarwood just said he looked delicious. We have more immediate business to do. Let's play, Matt, let's play. So. Delilah mentions to Silas that they aren't here to make enemies, they're just defending themselves from an intruder. In fact, if they can get an ally, that would be ideal. So as Vax saves out of the hold person spell, Silas looks into his eyes and attempts to charm him, with no spell, just with a magical gaze. Vax resists the effect, but plays along, implying that he can give them useful information, but not indicating what it is just yet, so he can try to stay alive a bit longer. He has them going for a moment, but ultimately, Silas sees through his deception. I think it's really interesting that Matt doesn't just have the Briarwoods strike right away. First, they say they'd rather have Vax as an ally. Then, they want to get information from him. And it's only as the discussion starts to turn south that the possibility of combat closes in. Also, I want to highlight this moment, which speaks to a lot of what I've been talking about over the past few episodes. You could give me a... Oh, shit. I'm right. You want an inspiration? Huh? No. <laughs> what are you asking for? I don't for? want shit. <laughs> what are you begging from the DM, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, that's why I said never mind. Liam starts to ask for inspiration and catches himself. Now, I don't want to linger too much on the act of asking for inspiration because while I could do a whole other video about best practices around inspiration, to be honest, it kind of doesn't matter. The cast of Critical Role never figured out a way to distribute inspiration that they were happy with, so they phased it out not long after this episode. And honestly, the designers of the game don't even seem happy with how inspiration works, considering how they keep making lateral changes to the mechanic in the 1D&D playtest. But as I've been discussing for the past few demystified episodes, the tone of their game is changing. Liam starts to ask for something that will improve his situation, and then he stops. He realizes it's best to just let the scene play out, let the dice fall as they will. And I just think it's interesting that we're starting to see the cast members becoming conscious of the fact that this game is developing into something more dramatic. And because of that, their behavior is shifting to fit the new format. Anyway, because Vax couldn't fool them, he has to roll for initiative versus the Briarwoods. As soon as Matt puts down the map, he makes sure Liam knows where the windows are. So, here you are. We're in range. Right there. <clears throat> Lord Briarwood is behind you. Yeah. Lady Briarwood is over here by the edge of the bed. These are the two windows. This is the layout of the room here. I can't take credit for this observation. This came from user T Laws in the original comments for this episode on YouTube. But it's a great point. Matt is sending a very deliberate message by pointing out the exits. He's saying, hey, you should really think about running, because you can't win this fight. Delilah hits Vax with a blight spell, and Silas strikes him, and then bites him and sucks some blood. Vax breaks away and leaps out of the window and calls into his earring, Jenga. That's the safe word, and now the rest of Vox Machina knows something is going on. Most of the party hooves it for the weapons check, but Keyleth becomes an eagle and flies toward where they last saw the Briarwoods in the palace. She releases a bit of bird poop on a servant along the way, but then she realizes she assumed that was a Briarwood servant, but it wasn't, and she wanted to save that for a Briarwood servant. Now, Matt starts to object. He definitely looks like he's going to say something, but once again, it's the other cast members who step in. Travis and Sam both say, It's too late. You said it. And Marisha says, Sure, it's fine. Again, this is an indication of the shifting tone of the table, and that the cast is starting to feel that they shouldn't walk back their actions. But even setting that aside, I also think there's a very deliberate reason Matt wouldn't want to walk back anything that happens in this episode. See, it's going to matter a lot that these players think very carefully about how their actions are perceived by the people outside the party. They need to start really thinking about how their behavior would be re received by the people of the world, and start taking 
every moment a bit more seriously. Fortunately, this isn't Matt deciding this unilaterally, it's the way the cast overall is starting to think about the game. But also, Matt in particular needs them to think twice before doing whatever they're going to do, given the circumstances they're in. Now, I don't know how deliberate that was on Matt's behalf, but considering they just rolled for initiative in the palace, it's a reasonable thing to make sure your players are thinking about. Tiberius flies after Keyleth and prestidigitates the bird poop. That was nice of him. But then the servant follows them. More on her later. Also, Tiberius is starting to charge up his bottle of endless water. I didn't realize this at the time, but what he's doing is planning to leverage the fact that vampires are harmed by running water to do damage to the Briarwoods when he gets there. Which, of course, Tiberius doesn't know there are any vampires. Vax only said Jenga. We can also overhear Marisha point out Orion's metagaming about how they know where Vax actually is. Again, the cast is policing themselves. They haven't quite hit their rhythm, and the cast is still struggling to figure out how to get to Vax and save his life without metagaming, and that's, that's totally understandable. But they're figuring out what's important to them, and they're starting to enforce it internally without relying entirely on Matt's judgment calls. Vex calls for a servant to find Uriel and let him know that there are enemies within the gates. She also whistles for Trinket, but he's pretty far away at this point. Meanwhile, Vax hits the courtyard two stories down and then gets locked up with another hold person spell. The Briarwoods drop down behind him and Vax catches a glimpse of Seeker Assume. It turns out he was hiding in the bedroom as well. That's, that's awkward. Delilah hits Vax with another damage spell and he drops unconscious. And then, right as they're about to move on from his turn, Liam pauses the game for a moment to relay his character's inner thoughts. I'm gonna let this clip play for a little bit longer because I think it's important. Wait, as that happens and as my consciousness fades away, I don't say anything, but here's what I think in a split second, okay? I think of my friends that I've spent so much time with. I think of Keyleth, beautiful, walking under the trees. I think of my twin sister as a young girl, folding at linens with our mother. I think of my sister as an adolescent in lessons smarter than me. I think of the woman that she grew into, hiking over many, many, many miles together. My best friend. My best friend, Exalia. And before I can think no more, I say a prayer to Saren Ray to watch over my friends and keep them safe. Go ahead and make a wisdom saving throw. Eight. Okay. With that thought cast out, the darkness swallows your vision and unconsciousness takes you into the cold, wet grass on the floor of the courtyard surrounding the palace. A small shiver runs down your spine, Vex. A feeling you haven't felt before. A feeling of sudden and immediate, sourceless dread. And in that instant, you know there is almost no time. I don't know exactly what was going to happen if Liam had made that wisdom saving throw, but focusing on that speech, we now know from Q&As that Liam really thought his character was not going to make it out of that fight. He thought, well, this is the end of Vax, so let's get one last moment out of him. And so he does what we would come to later expect from Liam O'Brien. He puts his heart on his sleeve, and he breaks our hearts with his sincerity. Laura also remembers at this point she cast Hunter's Mark on Delilah, so she is able to ping Delilah's location and direct the party to the proper courtyard. Scanlan teleports, but because he doesn't know the area, he has to roll to get to the right spot. He fails, and he winds up in the Briarwood bedroom. Now, logically, that doesn't make a ton of sense. Why would he wind up on the second floor if he knows the Briarwoods are on the ground floor? Because there's already a map on the table for the second floor, Assume is already there, Scanlan will have line of sight from the window, and Keyleth and Tiberius, and a certain servant, are almost at that bedroom door. 
Sometimes it's just easier to put someone in the same areas as the others, even if it doesn't make as much sense. The servant Keyleth pooped on follows the party to the room, and it turns out this is a guest star, Kit Buss. She's the artist who made the official Vox Machina character art for the live stream. She'd been visiting from the UK, and they invited her in for the game. It turns out she's not just a servant, she's a white tiefling who was hiding under a disguise spell. Assume joins the fight to try to save Vax, but Silas hypnotizes Assume, who backs off and starts firing crossbow bolts at the party. As the rest of the party rounds the corner, Vex sees her brother on the ground and shoots a few magical arrows at Delilah. Both are natural 20s. Delilah retaliates by casting a very powerful spell, and I want to highlight Matt's description. So much mana. You take 66 points of necrotic damage. Oh! What's the- A sickly uh, beam of black energy just streaks out from her finger, plows into your torso, and you feel as if your soul is temporarily pulled from a portion of your body. For a second there, your eyes glance past the threshold of death, and you manage to pull yourself back in. What the fuck are these people? Um, Son of a bitch. The cold resonates through the rest of your body, and all of a sudden the temperature outside, which was already pretty chilly, now feels freezing cold. Brush of the finger of death. What Matt is trying to indicate to his players is not just that Lady Briarwood is a very high-level spellcaster, although, yes, he's definitely telling them that but he's also warning them about what exactly Finger of Death does through his narration. I'm not sure they pick up on it, but his description makes a lot of sense when you know that someone killed by Finger of Death rises as a zombie on the caster's next turn. Although, technically, since this happens when someone is killed and not dropped to zero hit points, it's really not something that's likely to happen to most players when they get hit by the spell, but... Knowing that the group didn't have a firm handle on the 5e rules yet, and that Matt is definitely trying to present an extremely challenging villain, I think that dropping to zero hit points would have probably just killed Vex outright and made her a zombie. Which, even if it's not rules as written, and he knew that, would still be fine, it's their game. Scalen brings Vax back up with a fifth level healing word, hell yes. That's not the healing word, but it's cool that he did that. Percy calls out Silas's name and fires into him with bad news, his powerful rifle. So named because nothing travels faster. As you load the weapon, you, he says it loudly enough for you to hear, but this voice now, you see uh, Lord Byron says, Would you look at that, dear? The pup yet lives. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, a big chunk of flesh is just blown off and you can see the bone beneath. <laughs> That's Percy. <laughs> Thanks to Percy's damage, Silas isn't able to grab Vax again, so Vax is actually able to get up and retreat. Thank God. Delilah casts Feeble Mind on Tiberius, and now he can't talk or cast spells or communicate, effectively neutering him in battle and turning him into a giant lizard. Again, we're seeing Matt's wargamer tactics, take out the spellcaster. And since Vox Machina already has a reputation, it's fair game that Delilah would know who the powerful magician in the party was. He might have even referenced it during the dinner in the last episode. That'll be your turn, Scanlan. Oh, hi. <laughs> You're now there, face to face. You are essentially the shield of the group right now between the Briarwoods. Hello. <laughs> what a lovely dinner we had. Lightning! <laughs> <laughs> Silas is actively healing the damage he takes, and if that wasn't bad enough, he also draws a blade from his back that was invisibly hidden under some sort of disguise, much like how Percy hid his weapons by entering in the form of Vax. Silas now wields a black greatsword. That seems not good. Vex has two holy arrows, I'm not sure when she got those, probably in a pre-stream game, and fires them into Lord Briarwood and does a ton of damage. An interesting note, this isn't deliberately metagaming nor deliberately, not metagaming. She seemingly only targets Silas because he's in between her and Delilah. She refers to them both as potentially being vampires, and if my memory serves me well, this isn't just because they didn't see who bit Vax. This is how they refer to the Briarwoods for several episodes, under the impression Delilah is also a vampire, or at least assuming she might be. Anyway, those holy arrows do a number on Silas, obviously, so Delilah dimension doors away with him. The party gives chase and finds that the Briarwoods had teleported to their carriage, and now that carriage is on the move. Keyleth casts a sleet storm on the carriage, and it slips and crashes. Grog bellows out to close the gates, and the guards obey his command. The carriage door opens, and the Briarwoods emerge and face the party. Now, Matt essentially let players do a few things out of sequence as part of this chase, but now Matt resolves this next beat narratively. 
Also, this is something that can happen on Delilah's turn, and you can make the case she would go now since she was at the top of the initiative. But really, Matt is trying to preserve the Briarwoods and set up the next adventure, so we are in full cutscene mode for this moment. But as soon as Vex saw the Briarwoods, she described taking an attack, so to make things fair, he gives her a chance to potentially react before the Briarwoods make their next actual move. The door kind of slams open, and you can see Lord and Lady Briarwood kind of step out. Can I shoot my exploding looking. arrow? Hold on. This is as you guys are just turning the corner. Lady Briarwood's kind of against her shoulder, and she kind of goes, ah, At the very least, I think you should come visit us sometime, Percy. You're always welcome back home. It'd be nice if you visit your family once in a while. Roll initiative, just you, as you were the first action to take. 19. 19. Go ahead and roll. So poosh, a portion of the of the outside of the uh, the carriage just blows apart. Wood shrapnel goes flying to each other side. Um, as the smoke kind of settles in the explosion, you can see both Lord and Lady Barber are still standing there, seemingly unscathed by the event. Turn your phone off! She wraps her arms around him <clears throat> and she whispers in his ear, shh, it's all right. And they both. Shh. Vanish in a swirl of arcane energy. And there they go. They're gone. But certainly not forgotten. And we're out of initiative. But of course, the coachman is still present. He didn't get teleported away with the Briarwoods. And Percy has some questions. What do you know? About... about what? I shoot him in the right hand. <gasps> it's an easy enough hit. He's, he's, he's prone before you. Uh, Three of his fingers are blown off, and the kind of bloody stuff's <coughs> shaking it. I'm sorry. Look. You're from Whitestone, yes? I am. You don't know what it's like. I have no choice. Well, you do now. I reload again and put it on his left hand. Frederick de Rollo. Yes. Where is he? He's gone. He's gone, sir. I'm sorry. Lady Johanna. They're all gone. So they all. Julius yeah. de Rolo. I don't know. Vesper de Rolo. I don't know. Whitney de Lolo. De Rolo. Ludwig de Rolo. Oliver de Rolo. Your family is gone, sir. They were taken. They were killed. I'm sorry. You will tell us everything you've seen. Fight me, sir. They'll kill me. No, they won't. Because I will kill you first. Tell me what you've seen. After they come back from the break, Percy knocks the coachman unconscious, and Vox Machina decides to take the coachman back to their home, since they have a prison cell underneath Grey Skull Keep. The guards finally arrive and start to arrest the tiefling they don't know, since they don't really know what happened and they can't really arrest anybody else. Vax starts to explain that they just saved Sovereign Uriel's life, but this begs the question, did they? Do the guards know that? Do the guards believe that? All they know is that Vox Machina attacked some of their guests. They didn't see the fight itself. Keyleth pulls rank on the guards, since Vox Machina does have a ton of authority in town, so the guards say they're still going to investigate this, but nobody is under arrest at the moment. Meanwhile, Tiberius goes to Allura and uses Lockheed's telepathic connection to Tiberius, Pseudo-dragons have a limited telepathy for simple concepts. I don't know if I would call that a telepathic connection, but fine, whatever. He's trying to encourage Allura to help Tiberius, but she doesn't have the spell to cure him. The tiefling introduces herself to the group as Lilith. She reveals she's also a cousin of Zara. And then a glowing eye symbol appears on her chest, and she looks freaked out. This is the mark of the broker, the man who is hunting her down. And then Sovereign Uriel shows up and demands answers about all of this. He basically agrees that they need to go treat Vax's wounds and go get some sleep, and also go hang out with their guest stars, since Matt has some pretty specific stuff planned for the rest of the session. But they need to come back in the morning to meet with Uriel and talk this through. Yes, Vox Machina are trusted by Uriel, but so are the Briarwoods. So this is complicated. I'm going to take a quick moment here to pause the episode and say, if you want these videos to go weekly, come support me on Patreon. 
Once we get to 1,000 patrons, Critical Role Demystified will become a weekly series. The Patreon version of this episode actually has additional clips that I just thought were fun. They don't necessarily add anything to the commentary or to the recap, but I just wanted to share them because I like them. I'm going to be trying this approach for maybe a couple of episodes to see how folks feel about getting extended cuts of my Critical Role Demystified episodes on Patreon. Those are available to folks who support me at $5 a month, just like all the video content I upload. I'm also going to try very soon to go back to the system where the ad-free videos go up early on Patreon. I was on track for this video to be the first one to get back to that early release model, but then, you know, stomach virus. Those who've been watching my channel for a long time know that I lost my job in January, and it's been challenging to look for a new one. And the truth is, I think I have a rare opportunity here, and it might be time to embrace it. I think it's time for me to really try to have a go at being a full-time content creator. Obviously, I don't have the same financial safety net I used to have. I'm not getting a chance to leave my day job once this channel is as profitable as a normal paycheck. But the way the community has come through for me has been absolutely incredible, and so I'm really going to try this. I really appreciate your support. And now, back to the episode. Vax is still really concerned that he's going to become a vampire or something, and Liam is playing Vax as if he's lost quite a bit of blood, which is fair. So they take Vax and Tiberius to the Temple of Sarenrae. The priests cast a spell to return Tiberius's intellect to normal. Then they check Vax over, and thankfully, mechanically, there's no more danger to Vax. You're only at risk of becoming a vampire if a vampire bite brings you to zero hit points and kills you. But Matt also realizes that the party wants a slightly more satisfying answer than that. And you know, narratively, maybe a vampire bite should be a bit more significant than just, you'll be fine in the morning. So, like it ain't no thing, Matt just drops this detail. Uh, he kind of brings forward and inspects it for a second and reaches into the couch and pulls out some herbs and kind of presses them into it and burns a little bit. As, as the wood. Ooh, do I recognize what herbs he's using? I make a nature check. Nature check? Oh, yes. yeah. Is it sticky? <laughs> oh, yeah. Whoa! 19, so 29. This is glisfoil. Glisfoil is used uh, by, by many medicinal practitioners as a means of burning away infection <laughs> and cleansing wounds. He didn't even look we down. He Obviously just said it. it was glisfoil. Yeah, well, who didn't but... know that here, honestly? Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I try my best to demonstrate the lessons we can learn to try to demystify the process of GMing. I don't like to lionize people. I don't like to just say, well, Matt Mercer is just a very good DM. That's just how it goes. But listen, I don't have an explanation for this. He's been doing this for an extremely long time. He's very good at it. But setting aside the specific example of being able to come up with a fictional medicinal herb at the drop of a hat, either improvised because he's very good, or just because he's done a lot of work on his lore, I don't know, it doesn't really make a difference. I do think we can learn from the fact that he saw that his players, especially Liam, didn't just want to be told that the wound was nothing to worry about now that the vampire was gone. So he made sure there was a treatment available to help validate Liam's choice to play the wound as something significant. Keyleth actually requests some glisfoil she can take with her, because when you give players insight into how the world works, they're going to want a way to interact with it and continue to use these rules to feel more like they are a part of the world. Tiberius asks the priest to bless his decanter of endless water so it contains holy water. It's going to take a couple of days, but it can be done. They leave the temple, and Vax apologizes to the group for being so reckless and going off half-cocked, and especially apologizes to Percy. He also gives Grog a chance to offer some reprisal, and Grog immediately slaps Vax upside the head. Matt has Grog roll for damage, and Vax takes enough damage from the slap to simulate a level 1 character stabbing someone with a dagger. But Liam especially likes taking voluntary physical damage whenever Grog inflicts some wound or abuse on him. Again, it's an approach that helps validate Travis's character as the beefiest, strongest dude in the room, which is a key part of what makes Grog fun. And then, as the party is leaving the city and walking to their keep, as they're discussing what might happen next, whether they're going to face the Briarwoods, whether the Briarwoods are going to come to them, how to handle the prisoner in their keep, how to keep Lilith safe from the Broker, well, one of those problems kind of resolves itself, because the Broker shows up. He's a very well-dressed tiefling, flanked by two enforcers, a big man in a mask, and an old woman with a wand. The broker is here for Lilith, apparently to collect on a contract commissioned by her sisters. The party takes a few power stances to square off and flex, to let the broker know not to mess with them. As part of that, Keyleth casts Anti-Life Shell to create an area where they can't be harmed. And Matt takes this as a cue that the others are going to leap into action. He argues that any time somebody casts a spell, that's pretty much going to mark an aggressive action to most people, regardless of whether or not they know what the spell is. And so they all roll for initiative. 
I don't have a lesson here because I actually already did a video about the psychology of initiative and I talked a lot about this subject. So make sure to check that video out here. But we're an initiative, so here are some highlights. Look, it's not even a fair fight. Most of the party barely got a chance to do anything in the last combat. It was over so fast. So here, they all get a chance to try some new stuff. And they maybe have some frustrations to vent. What is wrong with you? Don't you see there's nothing here for you? Run away before you die. There is no option. And I'm just going to start unloading. Natural 20. <laughs> Uh, 19. 19 hits. All right. Cool. Blowing an action surge. I'm firing three more times. Okay, first and foremost, how do you want to do this? <laughs> See the nostrils? I'm going to get a little weird, and I'm just taking straight chest shots, and I'm just firing chest shots, and I'm just making a hole the size of a baseball in his chest. <laughs> and as it happens, as I keep unloading, the gun still breaks, and I'm still pulling, oh. pulling the trigger. <laughs> You fool, your soul is forfeit! Die! Die! I'm gonna look at the other two and start pulling out my bigger gun. Keyleth is stunned to see the side of Percy, and so she drops the anti-life shell and just stares at Percy. Vex glues the beefy guy in place with a tanglefoot arrow. The old woman starts to run away, but Scanlan puts her to sleep. Tiberius finishes her off by using telekinesis to turn his crawl blade into a spinning buzzsaw. And look, we have to pause and acknowledge that the death of this old woman is going to be a whole thing in the next episode. For the purposes of this episode, a lot of the cast was totally down with taking her down. And Liam especially kept insisting she was an evil mercenary and she had to die. Is this a totally viable battle strategy? Was this just the heat of the moment and once they had a chance to sleep on it, they'd feel differently in the next episode? Did they not realize that killing someone who was retreating was maybe letting things get out of hand? Would they care if nobody brought it up the next day? We're going to talk about all of that in two weeks when we cover the next episode, but for this episode, let's just say, I don't care that much that Tiberius killed this old woman. How would I feel if it was one of my players or if I was in this party? I don't know. But I do know that if the old woman hadn't been running away, I don't think anybody would have thought twice about it. So as far as I'm concerned, the kill itself is not really the problem. The problem will come later, when they have to answer for it, and they are reminded that their behavior might make them look a certain way. And like I said, we're going to talk about that in my next Critical Role Demystified episode. For now, back to this episode. They drop out of initiative, and the beefy guy begs for death since he was vanquished in combat, but they instead choose to let him live. They're almost being cruel in this fight, all of them, and Vax has been especially edging them to do some dark stuff this time. They even take off this guy's mask, which was covering up some serious scars on his face. Lilith animates the body of the broker and commands it to go back to her sisters as a demonstration of the foolishness of hunting her. Then she tells the man in the mask to go and find a new purpose outside of her sister's control. Go to Vasselheim and join the Slayer's Take, or go fight in the Crucible. She travels with Fox Machina back to the keep to spend the night before she moves on. And honestly, I'd remembered that as being the end of the episode. But then we get this little moment, which is so... Fascinating to me, considering where this campaign is going. And as the twins are walking, I say, I, I guess... I mean, I, clearly I'm eating shit here today. I guess mm. I'm gonna make a promise not to stray from the side. Remember that promise. I promise. The fact that we have this minor preview of the do not go far from me scene from a future arc is just something I think is really interesting. At the end of the episode, Matt also reveals that the broker was an NPC created by a contest winner. Somebody got to provide the name and essence for a character in the game. And that's so funny because the broker's fight is going to have a ton of consequences, not just for the next few episodes, but arguably the trajectory of Percy's entire arc going forward. But more on that soon. Thanks so much for watching. The next Critical Role Demystified episode will be here in two weeks as we discuss episode 26, Consequences and Cows. This is an episode with some great stuff, especially in the second half, but it's also a hard episode to recommend for a lot of reasons. In the meantime, I have other D&D videos coming out every Monday and Thursday, so if you've enjoyed my Critical Role videos, please subscribe and ring the bell. A lot of my upcoming videos are going to be inspired by things that happened in this episode. There are just some things I just don't have the room to talk about in a Critical Role Demystified episode, and so they need to be their own video. So if you want to see those videos, make sure to subscribe. 
If you want to support me financially, you can subscribe to my Patreon. Every patron, even at $1 a month, gets me closer to my goal of making this series weekly, which I would love to be able to do. If you can't support me financially right now, I completely understand, but I'd still love for you to come and hang out in my Discord community. It is a lovely group of people, and at any given time, somebody is partway through catching up with Critical Role at various points during each of the campaigns, so you can find other folks who are probably in a similar spot to yourself in their point in the campaign, and essentially watch along with them as you catch up with the show. And the fourth and final way to support the channel is by signing up for my newsletter, where you can stay up to date with my latest goings on. I try to cover these episodes as delicately as I can while still sharing my perspective, and if you'd like to see me cover other vaguely controversial topics, I made a video about how I don't think the Forgotten Realms works very well in 5e products, you should probably check that video out. Check it out. It's right here. Go check it out. Until next time, play fair, and have fun.